You know, all of us have certain testimonies and, and things that are coming, that are happening in our life. And there are many trials and tribulations that we're going through and so forth. Um, and, and when we come to some of these things, um, it's almost like coming to a wall. Does everybody understand that? You know, it's like going to a wall. Lower it just a little. I can see it. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. All right. But anyways, um, you know, when we get to a wall, we don't know what to do sometimes. You know, uh, sometimes we try to dig under it. We even try and beat it down, but it ain't going to fall. The only way we can get through it is if the Spirit of God brings us through it. And sometimes we have too much change in our pockets to get through. In other words, we're carrying too much stuff. Something's up. But walls are used in our life to reveal things that are with us, in us, hindering us, holding us. And, um, you know, I, every time I, I, I hear about this, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit was dealing with me about this wall, I kept thinking about the wailing wall, you know, in Jerusalem, you know, the wailing wall. I'm thinking, man, every time people get to this wall, they begin to wail. <laughs> but you know what? When walls come up in your life, in my life, we begin to wail, Amen. you know, no matter what it is. You know, I, I mean, we, it's, we call wailing whining sometimes, too, you know. <laughs> It's an excuse for, I got problems. I think I'll whine about it because I don't feel like wailing about it, you know. But when we come to these walls, we've got to be able to do something. God allows these walls to come up, to be triggered in our life so that actually what comes up is a mirror so that we can see what's happening. You know, there's so many things, you know, that, that are happening in our life. And sometimes we're, we'll be going down the road and, 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 and the road with, in the walk with the Lord and all of a sudden something will come up and go, man, I thought that was done with. But you know what? You found out it wasn't. That it was still, still holding on to something. You know, and, and even if it was a piece of something that we're still holding on to, it, it's still there. You know, like a piece of radioactive material. You, 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 can, you can get rid of almost all of it, but if you still have a little sliver left in it, it's still hindering you, you know. It's still causing trouble. It's still causing sickness. Whatever it may be. But, you know, there are these walls in our life that God's trying to remove from us. In fact, let me share something about the Wailing Wall since we're talking about it. Um, the Wailing Wall, of course, we know is the uh, Temple Wall in Jerusalem. In fact, it's the only thing left truly in, in its standard, in its original state, that has been as a reminder of the Temple, you know, because they had to rebuild everything else. Uh, the holiest shrine of the Jewish world uh, is the Western Wall, is the part of the retaining wall supporting the Temple Mount built by Herod in two, or 20 B.C. After the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 A.D., Jews were not allowed to come to Jerusalem for a long period of time. Um, when they could visit, and they, at one time they could only visit once a year as an anniversary of the destruction of the Temple and wept over the ruins of the Holy Temple. Because of this, the wall became known as the Wailing Wall. Isn't that powerful? Jews were again not allowed to visit the wall from 1948 or not allowed to visit the wall from 1948 to 1967 when it was in the Jordanian section of the city. After the Six-Day War, the Western Wall became the place for national rejoicing and prayer as the last assembly, um, you know, as they began to assemble the last parts of the wall and the temple. So we see here because of the Six-Day War, they were able to take it back. And they actually began to begin to refurbish certain things and begin to try and fix some of the things up to maintain the wall. Uh, but it was the only thing that was reminding them of the true reality of the temple. But, you know, I mean, Israel became a nation in 1948, but in 1967, Jerusalem was retaken back. Amen. Amen. Um, the Western Wall is the only surviving remnant of the temple which stood in Jerusalem. The temple served as the closest connective spot between the Jewish people and God. During the exile and the distance, which followed the destruction of the temple, prayer remains as the only means available to maintain a divine connection. Sometimes these walls in your life and in my life are a connection. Unfortunately, they're not divine. <laughs> but they're a connection. Um, your, your, their prayers, they used to put their prayers, their prayers would be collected every week and taken down to the wall by the uh, Jerusalem staffers around the area. And they would put them in a the wall. So people, when they go to the wailing wall, what they would do is they'd put their prayers in the wall. 
And then, of course, they would collect them and so forth, probably throw them out afterwards. But, uh, you know, it, it was a resemblance of this place at the wall where they would pray and they would weep over what of the destruction uh, of the temple and what the Jewish people had gone through. Now, we know that um, Nehemiah was one who was called to rebuild the wall at that period of time. And let's go to Nehemiah chapter 4. That's why we're talking about the wall. Now, you know, when they were sent back, when Nehemiah was sent back to, to um, build the wall, he had it in his heart. He wasn't going to tell everybody what was going on. And in verse 17, it says, <clears throat> is everybody with me? Now, you got to understand that those who began to build the wall and whatever, everybody in the area was against what they were doing. And those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens, hello, loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other hand they what? And nobody was going to take that wall from them. Sometimes we get the same way, don't we? Nobody's going to take this wall from me. You know why? Because we don't even realize it's there. Does everybody understand that? We don't even realize that it's there. And we put up a defense to protect it and don't even know about it. And we're, and we're carrying this heavy burden and, and with one hand and a sword in the other hand. <laughs> and we don't even understand what's going on. But we know that we have this heavy burden and we know that we're trying to protect it. And we don't even understand why or what we're protecting. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us, <clears throat> there our God will fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of the men held the spears from daybreak into the, and until the spear, uh, stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, Let each man and his servants stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night, and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off their clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. That sounds like bondage, doesn't it? And it was. And to me and you, in this wall, now understand this wall that we allow to be built up in our lives, and this wall that we don't even know what we're fighting for sometimes, brings us into such bondage. It grips us with all kinds of fears and doubts and unbeliefs, and we're going to talk about some of these things. And you know why? Because we don't even know that it is there. Don't even know it. It's a wall. Joshua 6 and verse 1. Is everybody there? Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. I wonder what, what were they shut up in? In a wall. None went out and none came in. You see what walls do? Not only can you see out, but you can't receive in. It puts a hedge of protection. Sometimes we put up a wall right away because we don't want to see it and we don't want to deal with it. And sometimes we don't even see it and don't even know why. Let's go to verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you do, shall do six times. Or six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you what? Hear the sound of the trumpet. They had to do something, didn't they? They had to what? Hear. That all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. So we see here that um, the wall did finally come down, didn't it? It finally came down. And, and it took a big shout for it to finally come down. In other words, we had to hear something. We had to be able to get into a place 
where we were able to either see, because the Lord said, see, and then he said, hear. So we had to get into a place where we were able to see and a place where we were able to hear. Does everybody understand that? Amen. Praise God. Why don't I share that so we can get to the teaching now? Matthew 17. Matthew 17 and verse 14. And when they came to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into water. So I what? Brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, All faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you, and how long shall I bear with you, Bring him to me. So what he was, he rebuked them because of their what? Unbelief. They didn't believe. They didn't believe. You know how many of us turn into epileptics? You know what I'm saying? What did it say? He says he falls in the water and he falls in the. I mean, some of us just fall all over the place when that wall comes up, man. We bang our heads against it. We try to do all kinds of stuff. We try to get carnal dynamite and it doesn't move. It just don't work. You try and huff and puff and blow that wall down. <laughs> but it doesn't come down. Because there's only one way it can come down. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke, doesn't it? It's truth that sets us free, doesn't it? But we have to be able to see and hear. So that means that we have to be able to receive, doesn't it? You know how many times that wall comes up? Somebody be telling you something. You don't know what, man? Don't you understand this? I don't want to hear it. That's a wall... That's about six walls. <laughs> Can you imagine what that person said to me? That's a wall. And verse 18. And Jesus rebuked a demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we cast this thing out? And Jesus said, because of your what? Unbelief. Unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this what? Mountain. You know what a mountain is? A wall. A wall. Hallelujah. How many times we try and stuff that mountain underneath a rug and constantly trip over it till it finally gets to a wall? Well, we can't see nothing. It says, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for, for you. However, this does not come out except by what? Prayer. Prayer and fasting. Why? Because David said, I fast to chasten my soul and my flesh so that he could take dominion over it. Amen? Because he knew something was holding him back. And, of course, prayer is essential. Prayer is essential. Without prayer, you're never going to go through it. In fact, the devil's going to constantly build walls up to you where you can't pray no more. Amen. So he said it's a sigh, unbelief. In other words, we, <clears throat> they didn't have the revelation, did they? They didn't get the realization. Because it, when you believe, you have a revelation of something. If you believe it, you know it. If you don't believe it, you don't know it. Assuming is not believing. Right? That's not believing. Try, people try to use assume, assuming as faith. Well, I'm going to walk out in faith when God didn't tell them to. How many people are there testing God? How you know, many people probably fall off of cliffs and whatever? I don't know. You know, try and walk on water when God didn't tell them to. Be out in the boat. Okay, I want to walk on this water and they drowned, you know. Because that's assuming. That's assuming. There's a difference in walking in faith. Faith comes by hearing. That means God told you to do it. But and God didn't tell you to do it and you believe he did and it don't work. It's because God didn't tell you to. Amen. Okay. Let's go on. May I, Mark 4. So mar mountains are walls, right? Amen. And he said, man, that's all you need to, is a seed, a mustard seed. Mark 4, verse 30. And Jesus said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? Because a parable represents a what? Picture. That's why he spoke parables. Parables were spoken so that the Lord can give them a picture because parables are actually parallels of the natural realm and the spirit realm. It is like a mustard seed which, 
when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds of the earth on the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes what? Greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. So it began very small. Now he's talking about a mustard seed. Now let me share something with you. A corruptible seed can happen the same way. A corruptible seed can be imparted in me and you at some time in our life and don't even realize it. That becomes a wall. And every time we have a tendency to polish it, to water it, to clean it, to disinfect it, and allow it to grow. Because it's things that we won't deal with. And until we finally go, it's like a weed that grows in your garden. Did you ever notice how weeds can take over all of good grass? That kind of blows my mind, you know. What's the matter with this grass? Can't take over the weed? <laughs> I mean, we got to call Kemlon and everybody else and take the weeds out, you know. I mean, the blades of grass outnumber the weeds, but the weeds just don't go away. And if you water your lawn too much, what happens? The weeds overtake the lawn. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants us to water that corruptible seed so that it grows and becomes a wall. And until it is uprooted, not just cut off from the head, but uprooted, that wall is still there causing us trouble. And that's what happens is sometimes we think we're free from it. We'll be going down the road in our walk with the Lord, and all of a sudden something will come up and we'll go, whoa. We go to the wailing wall. We start grumbling and complaining and wailing. And we wonder, wait a minute. The thing is, is, we're so blinded to what just happened because that thing has been growing, growing, and growing. It's only been nipped off at the head but never rooted out. Amen? Oh, praise God. Psalm 27. Yes, thank you, Lord, for the parallel of the wailing wall. <laughs> Psalm 27. In verse 11. This is a cry out to Dave from David. Let's read this together, okay? Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in the smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. Did you ever notice that there are certain times in your life where this seems to be manifesting? Could be a wall. I would have lost heart unless I had believed. Remember, we just talked about what? Believing. That I would see the what? Goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, look at the next verse. It says what? Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So we see here that he says, teach me and lead me. When he said lead me, he said give me a plan. Teach me and give me a plan. He said, I believe God with my whole heart that he's going to move on my behalf. David hit a wall. He began to wail. Teach me. My enemies are coming against me. We have a tendency to blame everybody else. When a wall comes up, everybody else gets the blame. <laughs> That's a fruit of a wall. <laughs> That's a fruit of a wall. You blame everybody else. <laughs> you better write that down. <laughs> the fruit of a wall is the what? Blame everybody else. <laughs> Psalm 28, verse 1. <laughs> to you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me, I become like those who go to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplication when I what? Cry to you. When I lift up my hands toward your what? 
holy sanctuary. You know what he was doing? He was lifting his hands up towards the wall. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's where the sanctuary was, right? Okay. But he was crying out. He was wailing, wasn't he? David had hit a wall. Didn't know what to do. Was blaming everyone else. But he knew that God was going, he believed that the Lord was going to teach him with, and give, send him a plan. Hallelujah. Matthew 19. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 19, everybody's still here, so we're all right. What wall are you talking about? <laughs> what, you, what you talking about, man? What wall are you talking about? I haven't got any walls. What's those lumps on your head? I don't know. How come your veins are popping? I don't know. <laughs> Matthew 19. Hey, we can have fun here, right? And verse 16. <clears throat> Matthew 19 and verse 16. Read it with me. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? We've talked about this, but this is good. So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So he told them. Everybody seems to think that we're all doing the good thing. I'm doing keeping the commandments, man. I'm all right. Watch. And he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he was figuring this out. Let's see. I'm doing all these things. I'm all right. I'm all right. And the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. I've been a good boy for a long time. What do I still lack? Well, the one thing is, is he knew he lacked something. Because Jesus didn't say, you have it. So obviously, Jesus' response, he got it that he understood his response of saying, you lack something. And Jesus said to him, if you want to be what? Perfect. Perfect. Go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, perfect here is a representation of free. If you want to become free, because nobody can be perfect. But you know, when you have freedom, you're perfect. Does everybody understand that? You may not, you may not be perfect, but freedom is perfect. Does everybody understand that? Because, man, let me tell you something. To be tormented is the worst. But when freedom comes, man, you feel perfect. <laughs> Amen? So he said to him, okay, you're all right. No problem. You want to be perfect and you want to be free. Then sell all what you have and give it to the poor. But one, in verse 22, and he said, sell all you have, give it to the poor. Then come and follow me. Because he knew what he was holding on to. He wouldn't be able to follow him. And it was his will. This man just hit a wall. He didn't realize it was there. In verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away. Sorrowful. You know where he went? Wailing wall. For he had great possessions. And the Lord challenged him and said, come on. If you really want to be free, if you really want to be perfect... Sell what you have. Give it to the poor. Because your treasures will be in heaven. He said, no way. I worked too hard for this. I built many walls. You can't have them all. So what he was asking him is to give up something. And those create walls, things that we won't give up. Those are walls in our life. Sometimes we have a hard time giving up something. Well, I don't want to give that up now. What do you mean? I don't need to give that up. 
whether it be God may be dealing with you with too much TV, too much this, too, whatever it may be, maybe your attitude, whatever it is. Something's holding us that we won't give up. And that's why these things are coming up. Amen? My job, what are you, crazy? Hit the wall, had to give up something. It was very precious to him and needful to him. Couldn't live without it. <laughs> Didn't know he cared so much for it. Started wailing. <laughs> he, st he, went back, he went to the wailing wall. You know why? Because he couldn't make the choice. He couldn't make the choice. The wailing wall, when the wall comes up, there's always a choice that has to be made. What am I going to do? Okay? What am I going to do? God is asking us to give up something. You know? I don't know anybody. He's not asking to give up something. Sometimes he's asking you to give up yourself. <laughs> give yourself up, will you? Whatever it may be, something we're holding, something too precious, too much of a possession that we're re relying on. And he's asking us to give it up. Because every time, you know what, let me tell you when you have a wall, there's, God allows triggers to come up. He allows certain things to come up. And when they come up, man, do we get defensive. Whoa. Very defensive. We can get angry. We can get jealousy, hatred. All of these things can manifest in our life, whatever it may be, where there's a wall. Well, I don't have any walls right now. Wait. <laughs> God's not done with us. Amen. Wait till tomorrow. You just got the teaching tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, tomorrow you write down what wall you had, amen? <laughs> so this brother here ran and hit a wall. Jonah hit a wall. Turn to Jonah. Jonah hit the wailing wall. <laughs> the wailing wall, right? The wailing wall took Jonah for a ride. Jonah, verse 1. Oh, this is good here. I like it. Jonah 1. 1 1. Now the word of the Lord came to who? Jonah. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. What's he going to do with it, right? The son of Amatia. Something like that. Sin, arise and go to where? Come on, read this with me. Nineveh. The great city and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarish from the presence of the Lord. Isn't that something? I mean, come on. The Lord said, Jonah. And here's a man who had heard the voice of God. And he says, see ya. I'd say he had a wall. There was something that he didn't want to deal with. <laughs> and he went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarish. So, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tar Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He thought he could go in the, in the bowels of the ship and get away from the presence of God. But the Lord sent out a great wind of the sea, on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. He couldn't run. Couldn't get away from God. Then the mariners were afraid. And every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down and was fast asleep. Tell me a wall wasn't keeping him all asleep, man. I mean, you know, this man had walls all around him. He was like, forget it. You know, walls sometimes numb us and dumb us. Walls will numb us and dumb us. Who, me? We have a tendency to run from walls. That's it. I'm packing and leaving. 
All right, I'm, I'm getting an airplane ticket. I'm out of here. You know how many marriages are destroyed because they want to run from a wall? You offended me. No, that was just a wall in your life, man. It was triggered. Remember the disciples that were walking with Jesus and he said, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood? They said, you're crazy. I ain't following you. He said, did I offend you? They were gone. Then he turned to his disciples and he said, yay. Go with them? They said, no, Lord. They didn't have the wall, did they? But the other ones did. They couldn't take it. You know why? One of the things that God does with walls also when we finally realize is we want it, he wants to show us us. He won't let us go any further until we're really willing to deal with us. That's what walls are. You can't go through them. You can't rent a bulldozer. Nobody else can pray you through them. It's you and God. Pray for me. No, pray for yourself. That's your wall, not mine. I got enough. <laughs> Verse 6, would you read it with me? So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? <laughs> what are you doing down here, bonehead? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast the lots, and the lots fell on Jonah. Couldn't get away. He was willing to keep silent all the way. I mean, he knew that the wind, he knew what was going on. The ship was about to break because God was on him. The Lord told him what to do, and he said, No way. I'm not doing it. Jonah hit a wall, and that wall was about to sink him. And they said to him, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you, man? What's up? Get rid of that wall. You're killing us all. <laughs> come on, man. Don't you know your wall beats everybody else up too? <laughs> Please get rid of that wall. It's killing me. In verse 9, so he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and, he, and said to him, Why have you done this? Why have you lied to us? You know why he lied to them? Because he didn't tell them the truth from the beginning. Walls always cause lies. They do a lot of buts. But, 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 but. Not I. Oh, it's your fault, not mine. In verse 10, then the men were... Exce oh, we do that? Okay. No. And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then he said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? All right, what are we going to do with you, man? For the sea was growing more temptuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. And the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Our walls cause problems for everybody else. So these men weren't foolish. They did immediately what they thought was going to save their life. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to the land, but they couldn't. For the sea continued to grow more temptuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. Now they prayed to Jonah's God. And do not charge us with the innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. In other words, they were praying before they were going to throw Jonah off. Do you understand that? They said, Lord, please... Innocent blood. We know he's your servant, but you know, he's got a goat. <laughs> <laughs> it's you and God. Your wall, you, I see you. So, 
So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. You know what they did? They got saved. Praise God. But you know, <laughs> now remember, not all your walls are going to save everybody. They may torment them enough to go to the Lord. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> but it may torment you right out of position. You may get thrown right off the boat. Hello? And we all need to stay on the boat until it's time to walk on water. Hallelujah. Is everybody all right? Should we go further? Praise God. Let's go to First Kings. Chapter 19. Glory to God. First Kings chapter 19. Hallelujah. First Kings chapter 19, starting at verse 1. Everybody there? Now you got to understand something. Elijah just got done killing 400 prophets, calling fire down from heaven, and out, and out running a chariot. Right. I mean, come on. I mean, he saw the hand of God, the power of God. I mean, he saw it happening. I mean, he was, whoo, whoo, man. Oh my God. Yes. Didn't know he had a wall in his life. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he executed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. That was only a message. And when he what? He saw, he saw that. You got to understand something. The hearing went to seeing. Does everybody understand that? The hearing went to seeing. When he saw that, well, what do you mean what he saw? He heard what was going to happen. He got the vision of him dying. You know what gripped him? Fear. Fear is a great gripper. That is a big wall. In fact, that's what is the mortar in the wall is fear. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his what? For his life. And went to Bathsheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. He said, see ya. I know you're my servant, but listen, man, I got a wall I got to deal with. And he was out of there. He was running from fear. He just forgot about fire coming down from heaven. Walls. Walls separate you from the things of God. They make you forget. You know what happens when walls come up? I don't care. I don't care. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down underneath a broom tree. And he prayed that he what might what? Die. Oh, well, that's called the wailing wall, isn't it? Oh, Lord, I've done all I can do. I've had it. Kill me. Take me home. I can't go any further. And the Lord, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father. See, the devil brings us to us when we hit those walls. He begins to accuse you, abuse you. He's waiting right at the wall. See, the devil leans on those walls. Hey, you remember I'm the one that planted that? Because the devil is the wall builder. He's the one that causes us to water it, to mold it. To keep it clean, we even dust off the dust on the wall sometimes. Then as he lay and slept underneath the broom tree, suddenly an angel came and touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Obviously he hadn't eaten. <laughs> then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. You know what? 
It wasn't until he finally went to sleep that he was able to hear. Because walls bring deafness to the voice of God. Walls bring deafness to the voice of God. <clears throat> and the angel of the Lord came the second time, touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and he went into the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. I'm not sure what kind of food that was. Um, i sure like to know if he went 40 days and 40 nights and just, amen. I mean, if, the, I, if an angel came and cooked for you, it must have been good. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here? <laughs> Elijah, what are you doing here? And so he said, I have, I've, I, I've been very zealous for you, Lord God of hosts, and I've done all these great things for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. What's he doing? Blaming everybody else. Torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. To make a long story short, the Lord said, you're crazy. You have a wall. Go back where you came from. <laughs> Hello? Get rid of your fear. Did you forget everything that just happened? Get rid of your fear. Fears are great walls in people's lives. Great walls. So we see that even Elijah had a wall, didn't he? Let's go to Judges 16. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know you're remembering some of those walls right now. You better write them down. <laughs> Which one? Yes, all of them. Praise God. We got more paper here. <laughs> Judges 16 and verse 4. Now we know Samson had some walls in his life. Judges 16 and verse 4. Would you read it with me? After it happened, is everybody there? That he loved a woman in the valley of Sarak, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And everyone will give you 1,100 pieces of, of silver. Wow. So what was trying to happen here. Remember, the devil doesn't go after your strong points. He goes after your weak. You understand that? So he was trying to find Samson's weakness, not his strength. He already knew what his strength was. He was trying to find his weakness to disarm his strength. Is everybody with me? Okay. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be found to afflict you. Come on, you'd have to be a real bonehead to tell her. I mean, for her to come out that way, I mean, you know, just like, okay, tell me, how can I kill you? Samson had a wall. He was blinded. Walls bring blindness. Samson said to her, if you do this and you do that, it will work. But he lied to her three times, didn't he? And go to uh, verse 15. Finally, she got fed up with his lies and she said to him, 
How can you say I love you? When your heart is not with me because you won't tell me how I can kill you. <laughs> you have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she what? pastored him daily with her words. You'd think he would leave finally. But you know what? He had a wall of lust. Couldn't leave. Blinded him. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was what? Vexed to death. She drove him nuts. But you think he would leave. But no, that wall blinded him so he couldn't. Then he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has, can ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak, be like all other men. And he did. Do you understand? The devil uses walls to find your weaknesses. Excuse me. He uses walls to find your strengths. I'm sorry. To remove your strengths. Hello. <laughs> Let me get rid of my wall. <laughs> the devil uses walls to blind us, right? So he can get find our weaknesses and remove our strengths. That was Samson. Oh, praise God. Remember, the devil doesn't tempt you with your strength. He tempts you with your what? Weaknesses. In Matthew 11. And what's the fruit of a wall? Blaming others. It's your fault. Matthew 11, starting at verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed to, from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? He was in a wall. He was what you call behind the wall, right? <laughs> but come on, he, he's the one that baptized Jesus, right? He saw the dove come down. He saw, he saw, he saw all kinds of stuff, didn't he? Heard all kinds of things, man. Well, he got placed in prison, got all walled up. And he sent his disciples to say, hey, are you the one? When he knew he was the one. You know what happened? Doubt came. Doubt. Walls always bring doubt. They bring reasoning. And, of course, Jesus said, go tell them. Go tell John the things which you hear and what you see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blesses he who is not offended because of me. Proverbs 29, 22. 29, let's read it together, okay? An angry man stirs up strife, and a furious man abounds in transgression. A man's pride will bring him low, and the humble in spirit will what? Retain him. Whoever is a partner with a thief hates his own life. He swears to tell the truth, but he reveals nothing. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. So we see that anger and pride, lying and stealing and fear produce unjust men who cannot trust in God. Why? Because these are walls. These are walls in people's lives. This is how the devil triggers us. There's certain things that trigger us, that set us off. 
It's all been imparted by a corruptible seed that's been imparted in us at some time. A corruptible seed is a seed that's a lying seed. Does everybody understand it? It's a lying seed. Sometimes we've been hurt in our past or whatever it is and we're still holding vengeance or unforgiveness in there. Some of us still want vengeance on others. There's been a corruptible seed imparted in us that every time something occurs in our life, it gets triggered and the wall goes up. We can't see, we can't hear, we can't do anything but blame everybody else. And then when that's done, we go, woe is me. I'm the only one. And we say, Lord, kill me, take me home. <clears throat> Not willing to face it sometimes. Wanting to run from it. Go to Proverbs 30. In verse 7. Want to read it with me, please? Two things I request of you. Deprive me not before I die. What's he going to ask for? Remove what? Falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Let me tell you, walls deny God. They deny him. A wall will deny the Lord. And how do we deny him? By having, allowing him access to us. And he said, remove falsehood and lies. The falsehood and lies are what? Deceptions. Remove falsehoods and lies. Remove, remove the deceptions from me. In my life. Why do I get angry or jealous or why do I become controlling or manipulating? Why do I become fearful or arrogant or prideful? What triggers me to do these things? Romans 7 and verse 15. <clears throat> Read it with me. For what I am doing, I do not understand. Stop. For what I am doing, I do not understand. But I will. Does everybody got it? When you wait on the Lord, you will. It's like when people ask me, what are you doing about this? I don't know yet, but I will. Amen? Amen. I will know. I might not know now, but I will know. Amen. If we'll allow God to reveal it. Amen. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that is, is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that what? Dwells in me. Well, aren't lies sin? I mean, you know, corruptible seeds are a representation of sin because they're deceptive, aren't they? If there's something in your life, in my life, that we don't know, we're deceived, we're blinded to, it causes us problems, doesn't it? So that's why we have to go through things. So, I mean, circumstances allow these walls to come up. And believe me, when they come up, God puts a neon sign on them. The thing is, is we've got to be able to allow God to reveal it to us and not get so bonkered. We need to take dominion over these walls. Amen? And, you know, even though when it's gone, it doesn't mean that the devil's not going to try and bring another one. I mean, that's his job. But we have to know what to do with them. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my what? Flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but, to, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me, or corruptible seed. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do, to do good. 
For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my what? Mind, which is called memory. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is my member. So we see that the memory is a part of the trigger. Does everybody get it? Triggers are activated by memories. Oh, there's a lot of stuff here, but I'm not going to all that. The Bible tells us that God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear. But what? Power, love, love, and a sound mind. So we see fear disqualifies and disactivates what? Power, love, and a sound mind. Amen? So that's what he's trying to do. Unplug us. Oh, Brother David ran into a big wall. Big, big, big wall. Finally, Nathan had to come and reveal the wall to him. Let's go there. 2 Samuel 12. Now, uh, we know that David just got done killing his right-hand man to take his wife, got her pregnant. Amen? Got himself in trouble. He was supposed to be out at war, and he stayed in. In verse 1, it says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him, and he said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and another poor, and the rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little woo, lamb, one little wee, <laughs> which we had brought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own, <clears throat> it ate of his own food and drank from its own cup, and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for a wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And David, his anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And, of course, and he said, he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. And because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are the man. Sometimes things that we've done, we have forgotten. And that wall comes up. And we've brushed it underneath the rug but it always catches up doesn't it it always catches up and it has to be taken care of you know sometimes people just don't want to give up those things people in relationships they know they need to give up <coughs> and I'm not talking about marriages okay I'm talking about people and friends old relationships whatever that they need to give up and let God take care of it. He did something he forgot he did, didn't he? <laughs> he? Actually, he put a wall all around it. But you know, the one thing is, is David repented, didn't he? But he still had to reap what he sowed. He lost his son. His sword would never rest. And he brought a curse on his family where all, all the rest of his sons fell into fornication and lust. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. It says what? Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. That's called pride, right? No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may also be able to bear it. So God always prepares a way of escape, doesn't he? Amen? The problem is, is if we're not hearing or seeing or listening, right, there is no way of escape. In other words, he's always giving me and you a plan. Because once the wall is gone, it doesn't mean that the devil can't trigger it again. Does everybody understand that? So what we want to do is be prepared so he can't trigger that wall. Or when he does trigger it, we do not allow it to come up 
If it comes up, it goes right back down. Okay? Every believe, every human being has walls in their life. The problem is, is we don't take dominion over them. And the only way to take dominion over a wall is to have a plan before it happens. Has everybody got it? To have a plan before it happens. You know why? Because you and I know the cycles. We already know it. We, we, we know when something's about to happen because it's happened over and over and over. We, we know when we're triggered and we know exactly what we're going to do when it happens. But if we'll plan, you know, put a plan in action guided by the Holy Spirit, we'll know what to do. We won't allow that trigger to put, bring up that wall to where we become isolated, run, get fearful, why, get hurt, hurt everybody else. Does everybody got it? We can learn to take dominion over it by having a plan. Job had a plan. Watch, go to Job. Job uh, 19. In verse 13, he said, He has removed my brothers far from me, and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed. My close friends have forgotten me. How many of you all felt like that once in a while? Huh? Those who dwell in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. <laughs> I'm an alien in their sight. <laughs> I call my servant but he gives me no answer I beg him with my mouth my breath is offensive to my wife <laughs> and I am repulsive to the children of my own body even young children despise me I arise and they speak against me all my close friends abhor me and those whom I love have turned against me my bone clings to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. You know why? His hope was in the Lord. God gave him a plan of escape. Remember how many times his wife came out and said, why don't you just curse God and get it over with? He said, nope. I'm not going to do it. Job lost everything, but was rewarded for giving everything up. He was rewarded for giving everything up. See, he thought he had the best of everything. But God gave... In the carnal mind, we think we have the best of everything. But you know what? God's got something better. Oh, if we could just give them up. And give this up and give that up. Amen? And let God bring the better. You know, people have a hard time... Uh, giving they're, they're so afraid I mean some some of them give tithe right to the penny nineteen dollars and thirty two cents like man you need to get rid of that wall <laughs> you know? I mean, there's a person that's bound by fear and don't, don't want to give to God <laughs> nineteen dollars and thirty two cents I must fall off my seat when I see some of those sometimes <laughs> like you know I mean, at least round it off. And don't steal God. Don't rob God of his 32 cents either. <laughs> Go to 1 Corinthians 2. Money is a great wall. Woo! Money is a great stumbling block for some people. Whoa. Money don't buy freedom, does it? We tried it and it didn't work. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. He's talking about a plan, isn't he? 
For God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the what? Deep things of God. So we definitely know we have to get in the Spirit, don't we? We must get this plan. Go to John 14. And God's plan for us is good, victorious, and a way of escape. <laughs> now you know you're going to have to be real honest with yourself for these next couple of days. John 14 and verse 26. John 14 and verse 26. Let's read it together. But the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now understand this. He will not only bring to remembrance the things that the Lord says, he'll bring to remembrance the things that trigger you. Okay? He'll bring to remembrance certain things. You know, there are certain patterns and certain cycles and certain things that have happened in our life that we know something's about to happen again. And that wall will come up and go, well, I don't care. Well, oh, what we try to do is, oh, I'm giving it to you, Lord. And the Lord goes, no, you're taking care of it. How many people try to give things unto God when the Lord says, you got to take care of it? Amen. Amen. I'm not dealing with this right now. You take care of it, Lord. No, you take care of it. It's your wall. I'll bring you through it. Let me have access to it. Amen? That's where we, that's where we got to take dominion over it. We've got to have some kind of a plan. To, okay, I know what I'm going to do. See, the Holy Spirit is trying to bring to your remembrance. See, what happens is when we try to cover it up, we begin to lie exaggerate, paint another picture and actually believe what we're thinking. And it's not true. Because of these walls. Certain desires will trigger these things, whatever. The devil knows exactly how to trigger certain walls in our life. And man, is he like a paint a picture. Believe me, when a wall comes up, he's got a picture for you on there. And it isn't true. But the Holy Spirit is trying to bring to remembrance the pattern. He's trying to bring remembrance. You know, I, I always use this quick story. Um, there was a guy that used to be in the discipleship house. He was here trying to get help and whatever. And I remember I heard a story about someone who um, was out using drugs and, 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 and to lie, he, he, uh, to say he was gone for a while, he cleaned off the bottom of his oil pan and he got a crayon and marked it and said that he had troubles and that he had to go to the uh, junkyard to get whatever well this one dude was late right and he was it was about 11 o'clock at night and he, well, he called him it's like you know in my spirit i was like he, he's 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 messed up well he came he came in that night and he had all these excuses and i and on my way home i went over i got on my knees and i looked under his car of what he was saying and he had a marker and all the other stuff on there and i knew in my spirit because the holy spirit reminded me of the story that I had heard, and I knew the dude was lying. Does everybody understand that? See, the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance not only those things, but things that are about to happen. Watch this. Go to uh, John 16. So if he's going to bring things to remembrance, he's also going to tell us things to come. And verse 13. John 16 and verse 13. Everybody there? Read it with me, please. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So he's going to guide you into all truth, isn't he? For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he, and he will tell you things to what? To come. So you see the importance of having a plan. Now, let me share seven quick things with you about a plan. Number one, we need to know ahead the true things that trigger us. We need to know the true things that trigger us. And everyone in this room knows the things that trigger you. You know, when someone says something, their tone of voice, however it may be, something that irritates you or triggers you, whatever it is. 
Number two, we have to look for the patterns or cycles that are involved in the trigger. The patterns or cycles that are involved in the trigger. The Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance. Okay, I know I did that again. See, what he's trying, what he's trying to do is bring you the results. Does everybody understand that? <laughs> he's trying to show you the results of the trigger. He knows that if you go any further, what's going to happen. So we already know, don't we? The third thing, you must plan to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> plan to keep your mouth shut keep your mouth quiet because so many times we have a tendency to be defensive right because we want to blame everyone else for what we've done because we're the ones that got triggered or actually it's our responsibility and our fault anyway remember dead people don't get offended fourth thing we need to do is go pray and get direction from the Spirit. The fifteen is to get counsel from the Word. The sixth thing is to get counsel from the office. And the seventh thing is to wait on the Lord. One, know ahead the true things that trigger. Number two, look for the patterns or cycles. Number three, plan to keep your mouth quiet. Number four, go pray and get direction from the Spirit. Now you got to understand something. The Holy Spirit isn't going to sometimes, because of your frustration, the thing is that you want to do is to go pray. It doesn't matter whether you hear or not. Believe me, just by going to go pray, you're already doing something. All right? If you've gone, the Bible says, Seek ye the kingdom of God and all things will be added on you. If you'll just go pray, no matter what, I don't care, go pray in tongues for ten minutes. Five minutes, just go seek the kingdom. And the next thing you know, he'll quicken you. Then you go get counsel from the word. He'll lead you to something. Then you get counsel from the office. And then you wait on the Lord. And as you wait on the Lord, you'll find peace. He's going to give you a picture, a vision. Something's going to happen. And he'll impart it in your spirit so that when that trigger comes up again, you'll be able to push it right down and keep on walking. Amen? And let me share something with you. When you find that more triggers are happening in your in your day, take the day off. When you know that you're being triggered up badly, huh, just shut everything. I don't care if you go in your bathroom, if you're at work, take 20 minutes, 30 minutes, amen, and get out of there. Because eventually, you're going to bite the bait. And you're going to offend whoever and yourself. Get yourself in trouble. Amen? Because what happens is they're defensive. I'm all right. I'm right. There's this. There's this. I know what. I'm... And you're going to get in trouble. Amen? Remember, there's only one right, and that's the King of Glory, Jesus. And he's trying to bring us to that place where we have dominion over these triggers, over these walls, and bring them down quickly. Amen?